Let's pray. Lord, as we come to you today, we're, we're getting in deeper each week on, uh, on this sex and sexuality, and we need uh, great insight and compassion today as we take a look at this issue of gender identity. So let it be for your glory, for our good, and for the good of the world that we will interact with this week and in years to come. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Yeah, I mean that seriously because you, you are the people that God will use to interact with those who are hurting and living in our confused world. And as we continue our series on, on uh, sacred sexuality today is, what is this, digits or fluidity? Some of you may go, oh yeah, I understand that completely. And others are like, what the heck is that? Right? It's the, the question of gender identity. And so for some of you in here today, you're going to be like, I totally get all of this. And for others, you're like, you got to be kidding me. I, I can't believe this. So hang in there because we're going to do some definitions. And then we're going to hear some stories of people who've gone through this process. And we're going to hear from God and what his word says about it. I want to tell you a story. This was probably two and a half years ago. I was uh, working with our, our high school youth in Virginia. And of course, we were right across the street from a high school. So in the youth, we had two new youth that day. And one was a young lady who was a junior, and she said, I'm a lesbian. And then there was another young guy, and uh, he was, I think, a freshman. Uh, he had really long blonde hair with some pink and blue in it, and uh, dressed neutrally. And uh, apparently, we'll use his name as Nate. Uh, his name was Nate but he wanted to be called Natalie. Uh, he was transgender. And so, here's my question for you. He just comes up there. How are you going to address him? Are you going to call him Nate? Or are you going to call him Natalie? Such is the dilemma of our world today. We're going to hear from a young lady named Daisy in a few minutes. My son, Nathan, he's 27, and he, he showed me uh, about Daisy. She's on YouTube. Um, Daisy went through the transition process and then detransitioned. We'll hear about that. Um, but she used the term 2015. That was when Bruce Jenner came out as Caitlyn Jenner as trans explosion. So as we've gone through this issue of sexuality, you, you know, last week we talked about homosexuality, and that's been around, and it's, we kind of saw that coming, and how that was changing in our culture. In the gender identity issue, that has kind of just exploded in a very short period of time, to the point that it's caught many of us off guard. What do we do? I don't really even know exactly all what this is. So. What we're going to do is, what is gender identity, right? We're used to, what's your biological sex? You're male or you're female. You're XX or XY, right? That's the way it is. That's what God's word says. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him male and female. He created them. He created male and he created female. He didn't create in between. And he didn't create one to become the other. So we're used to biological sex, but gender identity is the idea of how you feel about the sex that you are. So what is your gender preference? So we have many individuals who say, I'm a man, I was born a man, but I'm very uncomfortable with that. That's gender dysphoria. Right? We're used to the word euphoria. If it's euphoric, it's really incredible, right? Well, dysphoria is the opposite. So I'm in this man's body, and I'm very, very at un uneasy about being a man. And I really think what I am is I'm a woman trapped in a man's body, or vice versa. Now, I know for some of you, you're like, huh? But this is a very real thing, and it's a very real trending thing as well. So 
We distinguish between sexual identity and gender identity. And Sam Alberry is a great guy to listen to. Sam Alberry, go, go watch some of his stuff on YouTube. Um, but sexual identity is who you sleep with or who you want to sleep with, right? Which sex you want to sleep with. Gender identity is who you want to go to sleep as. And that is the difference. Now, so transitioning is an individual who has gender dysphoria and decides they're going to take drugs. So if I'm a woman, I'm going to take testosterone. And then I will become more masculinized. And then I'll have surgeries and I start actually removing body parts so that I can become a man. This this is our world today. And then detransition is to reverse it. Because what happens is, and what is, is happening, is individuals are transitioning to the opposite gender. They're finding out, wait, wait a second, I, I made it over here, but I'm still empty. This didn't solve my problem. And so they'll detransition and go back. Now, this is Daisy Chadra. This is the young lady that my son told me about. Really incredible life story and her process of transitioning and then detransitioning. So, as a young woman in high school, she did not feel comfortable. She often acted out like a guy, dressed like a guy, and finally decided to transition. And so she ended up becoming Holly. Changed her name. Transitioned, had surgeries, had testosterone. You're going to hear her in a minute, and she's got a really deep voice. You know, I listened to um, several individuals on YouTube and listened to their stories about transitioning and then detransitioning. And, you know, what it struck me is, is they talk about the incredible challenge and pressures of, of being this person that they didn't think they were. And then you throw on all of the societal expectancies. What a man's supposed to be like. What a woman's supposed to be like. Um, the sexual, hypersexual world that we live in. And how that, that changes their images. Right? One, one woman talked about how the struggle with her that men were only interested in her body. And she was very uncomfortable because she already had this dysphoria and now she was just a body. What about the person underneath? Uh, there's eating disorders, depression, all of these kinds of things. And you know, I got thinking, hmm, a lot of that sounds like when I was in eighth grade. When I was in eighth grade, I hated how I looked. So I blamed it on my parents, right? <laughs> it came from them. And then what I did was I tried to remake myself, but I did it a different way. You know what I did? I, did, I started smoking weed and drinking beer because that would get me a different kind of acceptance. And, but today, well, yeah, that's still an option, but there's also this option. I can go onto YouTube and I can listen to these people. and Well, maybe I can transition. Maybe the problem is I'm really a man in a woman's body. And, and that, was, that was Ollie's situation until Ollie got to the point and Ollie realized that didn't work. I'm still empty. And we're going to hear a little bit of that journey. But you see, here's, here's Sweden. This study came from Sweden and they tracked transgender people who had done the transition for 10 years after they did it. It's the only really good study because a lot of science is being hijacked today. But they found that, and Sweden's a really liberal country, transitioned individuals were 19 times more likely to commit suicide than the general population. See, it goes back to a few weeks ago with, did God really say? Only now it's, did God really make you as this way? And 
And so what we want to do now is I, I want you to listen to just a few minutes of Daisy's journey to where she came to faith in Jesus Christ. So if we could play that now. And by the way, this is you're not going to see the video because I couldn't sync up, you know, how the words and the sound are different and it looks really weird. So just listen as this goes. My interest in Christianity emerged alongside my doubtful feelings of transition. Before that, I had doubts, but I always kept them at a certain distance. And because if, if I faced them, I would have to, it would mean that I would have to contend with my maker, essentially. I had believed in God before this, but not a personal God. Not a God that intentionally makes and guides every single individual. Not a God that cares about me. I think even then, I really believed all these things deep down but I couldn't face them consciously because of what its implications were for my life. Not just my detransition, but everything in my life. And I still couldn't shake the feeling of God, that there was a God. And even back in high school, when I thought I was this hardcore atheist, I still believed deep down. I just couldn't admit it. So, and I just chose not to think about it for many years, which seems crazy now because it's all I ever think about. But again, what we're most terrified of, we tend to make less real. Around this time, I started watching like Christian lifestyle videos on YouTube where people would talk about their faith and how it influences their life. And I remember being repelled and fascinated by it at the same time. And I remember thinking too, that if I ever became a Christian, I, I wouldn't want to be like that, you know, uh, living with restrictions. And I realize now that I treated transitioning like it was a resurrection, right? I didn't understand how religious my motives were for transitioning. I wanted to be born again, but I wasn't willing yet to do it in Christ. I wanted to be in control, not to submit, to cede control. So I chose to worship my identity, to worship masculinity. But you see, in order to be born again, you need something higher than you to go to. You can't die to yourself and be born again without God. I was the determiner of my self-definition. I couldn't deal with the female part of me. I couldn't deal with myself as I was, as God made me. So I tried to erase, pretending I was moving towards something more authentic. But as I transitioned, it quickly became clear that that wasn't happening. And after I did, as I was experiencing, starting to experience regrets, I became much better acquainted with the part of me that was essentially female. I realized that I am in some ways very essentially female. I enjoyed performing a male role. And maybe some people would say that that's all identity and gender really is. Maybe it is, but I, I, don't, I don't think so. Uh, there's a part of me that feels deeper than that, a part of me that is God-given. And I finally realize I think that that part of me is female. How, I mean, how terribly I wanted to be a mother, how I imagined my future life how I needed, not wanted to be seen. And we need to be seen and loved for that, not for something else, even if it's more intelligible. And these were really, these were real desires. They, these are not culturally, like my wanting to be a mother and a wife are real desires and not culturally made tropes. And so during April, at the height of quarantine, I had to really ask myself what I wanted to get out of my study of Christianity. Because if you remember, I made a video about a year ago talking about why I study theology as a non-Christian, but I had to ask myself, you know, what is the ultimate goal here? Why am I doing this? And so one day I just decided I'm going to start taking the Bible seriously as truth, like as the truth, capital T truth. And I realized this might sound like self-indoctrination, but I was like desperate for meaning. And I keep talking about how I'm looking for meaning through this, but part of me maybe wasn't genuinely looking for meaning because of what I knew that converting would mean for my life. Thinking that you could really understand the Bible and have it affect your life in a meaningful way without submitting to it, without taking it seriously as what it says it is, is naive. Anyone who reads the Bible as cultural narrative or mythology, that's all it will end up being to them. Likewise, as something to criticize or laugh at. 
which is how I used to read it. So I started praying as I would read scripture. And I would pray with the understanding that the almighty God, the creator of the universe was listening. And I opened myself up to scripture and I didn't give my life to Christ just yet, but I opened myself up to scripture and prayer. And I would do this seriously. And I had some very powerful moments. There's really no other way to say this. I felt the presence of God. It wasn't really like I was looking for it. It just came over me. I probably made the decision to come to Christ sometime when I was in that prayer room because for the first time I knew what I really believed and I knew who I really was. I was God's. I belonged to God. And I had spent two years intellectualizing this and distancing myself from it and yet all I had to do was knock. All I had to do was seek him. That's what I prayed at the beginning, you know, just show yourself to me. And it was more real than any self-administered spiritual experience I've ever tried to have. And I realized in that moment that God, his presence I was suddenly feeling, had been there with me through all of it and had sent me through it, knowing that it would lead me back to him. And after this first encounter with God, I could suddenly understand what Christians were talking about when they talk about giving their problems to God. It wasn't a moralized thing. I didn't think I was doing something wrong by being trans. I think all sin is inherited from a type of self-worship, self-worship absent of self-acceptance. And that unwillingness to accept myself acted as a blockade between God and I, not because I was trans and that I needed, that that was superficially incompatible with being Christian, but because to be with God, I needed to adore his creation and not mine, to submit to his control and stop trying to control everything in my life. And it was a relief to come to this, the realization that I was not the one in control and that in the grand scheme of things, I had no control. These, these aren't talking points or empty, meaningless words. This is what I actually believe. Please see that. So I found my identity in Christ and not in gender. And I continue to worship and pray and read scripture with a submissive heart. And I have never felt more alive in my entire life. Maybe I never really felt alive in the first place. And this language maybe won't make any sense to a lot of you. And I'm not saying that to be judgmental, like, oh, you haven't experienced what I have. Like, that's not it. I'm just telling you what I've experienced. And anything else is completely beyond my understanding. What I do understand now is that I am saved. I am redeemed and that I am God's and not my own. And that's the only way that I can move forward with my life. Having come to that realization is by following him, is being authentic to myself as he has made me to be. I've heard that, I've heard that probably four times and I just keep going, wow. I mean, the insight that the Holy Spirit gave this young lady is really, really amazing. You notice the issue of control? Wanting to be in control. Wanting to call the shots. Boy, that, that applies to all of us in everything, right? <laughs> that's, that's the human condition. And so uh, what I want to do is I want to go through just a few things um, that we learn that she pointed out. First of all, look, all are created in God's image and have inestimable value, right? God created every person, even if they totally disagree with you, and maybe you feel threatened by what their vantage point is, they're still created in the image of God. And we need to learn to listen to people, and especially younger people, because if they're, if they're not listening to mature Christians, who are they listening to? YouTube. Their peers. Who have this really short perspective. I think it was a year or two ago, I was, I was reading a magazine, New York magazine, some kind, I don't remember what it was, but there were six transgender individuals who were interviewed. All six of them received the initial idea of transgenderism through YouTube. I mean, that's the power of YouTube. And there's great, I, I love it. I, I learned a lot from it. But we need to recognize every person's made in the image of God and we need to be there to listen to them. 
Second thing is we cannot read into our intuitions and feelings as to who we are. This was her, this was her realization, right? How I felt was not the same thing that what God said about me. Uh, it talks, uh, the Bible says, and Jesus confirmed this, at the beginning the Creator made them male and female. You know, there is one, there is one birth defect that I'm aware of. It's called uh, uh, ambiguous genitalia. It's, it's really rare. It's like 0.02% of the population where there's, there is literally biological sexual uh, ambiguity. That's a birth defect. We're not talking about how God created us. That's the whole thing. There's this tension because we're made in the image of God, but we're also fallen because of sin, right? That's where all, Sam Albury says, we're all a little distorted, including all of our sexualities, a little distorted. And that's what King David said. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. This is, this is a really common question. What do you mean? How can God make me and love me, but then I got all this mess? It's because God made us, but then there's original sin and the curse of sin that, that still affects us uh, today. And what we need to realize is that for a lot of people, this whole confusion, there was a lie that was planted somewhere in their life. And here was the lie. The lie was that being the sex they were was a bad thing. That is not what a boy is like. That is not what a girl is like. Here's a little boy. You look a lot cuter as a girl than as a boy. The lies that Satan will take, unbeknownst to us, we may have even planted some of them. And Satan will take them and use them to cause, cause great pain. Ultimately, what she understood which is what the Bible says, is we all have to be born again. What did Jesus say? This is what Mike read from the Gospel of John chapter 3. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. <clears throat> and Nicodemus said, well, how can someone be born when they're old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Well, that's exactly what Daisy wanted to do. She said, I need, I need to be born again. I need, I need to become a man. How do, I, how do I climb into my mother's womb and be born again as a man instead of a woman? And I, I, she had really astute observations here. She said, I didn't think of my transition as religious until I realized it was religious. I was looking for a resurrection. I was looking to be born again. And the problem was, when it happened and it was complete, she said, I knew it wasn't right. And she made a really powerful observation. To be born again, you have to die to yourself and you have to have someone greater to raise you up. My friends, that's the journey of being a Christian. She heard those YouTube videos and she was like, you know, I saw these Christians on these YouTube videos, but they were like submitting to God and to Jesus and to God's Word. I didn't want anything to do with that. Who of us does in our nature, our sinful nature? Only the Spirit of Christ in us says, absolutely I want to submit to Christ and His Word. I want Him to lead my life because I know that will bring the best of life. And that's why Jesus said, look, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. See, you, you know, we hear of gender dysphoria. The greatest dysphoria that ever happened in a human body was in the body of Jesus Christ. But it wasn't a gender dysphoria. It was a sin perfection dysphoria. Right? Listen to this passage. This is Isaiah 53. Surely he took up, and you say the underlined words, our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. You will hear so many people. Why did God make me this way? They feel like they were punished by God. Jesus got punished for us. 
but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. You know, whether it's a sexual issue or any kind of suffering that you're going through, maybe it's a relationship, and this is just so broken. You know, you have a Savior who can completely relate to your pain, your struggle, and your suffering. He is not unaware of how painful it is. He experienced it himself. And he's there for you. And that is an incredibly comforting thing. Paul said it this way, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. Jesus literally was this perfect human being who God made sin. Kind of a transition. But it was a spiritual one, and it was one of punishment. Because if Jesus would take that, then we would never have to worry about being in God's good favor. So when we put our faith in him, he always looks at us and loves us. And he knows the struggles we go through. Here's just a few insights that, that Daisy had. One, transitioning, right, was a, really a process of trying to be born again. You had to have someone greater than yourself to be born again. Her deepest desires when she, when she became really neutered, you can't become a different sex. You can neuter yourself. And when she did that, she realized that her deepest desires from God were that of a woman. In fact, when you listen to more of what she said, she came to realize that a lot of her struggle was her perception of how other people saw her as a girl. It was her perception. You know how many of us have those all the time? And our perception is not always reality is it and that's why we need to listen we need to keep communication lines open we need to be able to talk with people so they can share the struggles so we can guide them to God's truth that will truly set them free she gave a challenge to all of us can you understand the Bible and not submit to it she realized she, she had read it all superficially until she came to faith and realized she had to submit. So she would pray as she read the scripture, and she realized that God was through all of this with her. And that's true. God is always with us through everything. And then this was a really insightful thing. All sin is inherited, inherited from self-worship. Right? She realized that Wanting to be a man was saying to God, what you made me is not good. I'll be my own God and call my own shots and make myself a man. How do you perceive yourself? Just as a person in the eyes of God. Do you realize he's crazy about you? That he loves you? Even when, you failed, even when you failed him, he loves you dearly. And you know, when, you, when you've got your tail between your legs and you've just messed up, the devil's saying, see, and you call yourself a Christian, that's the devil at work. And you know what Jesus says? He says, you know what? That's wrong. Let's go a different way. I love you. You're my child. That's, that's a good, good father. Right? And her true identity was in Christ alone. So, a little intro as we get into next week and talk about how we respond, right? How do you care for uh, and share with others? But first of all, but in your hearts, Peter says, set apart Christ as Lord. It's not enough to have Jesus as your Savior you're not going to help anybody come to faith if Jesus is just your Savior. You've got to have Jesus as your Lord. He's your master. You need to model that. Because you know what? If he's your Lord, you're not afraid of what other people think. 
and you're not in a way to, to try and belittle them for what their thoughts are. Christians in this country have got to step up and let Jesus be Lord of our lives. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. That assumes you have hope. And that assumes that you actually live like you have hope. Do people see you that way? And do you let them know that your hope is in Jesus Christ? It's not enough for you to just have your hope and keep it to yourself. Hogwash. He wants you to share it with others. What are they going to learn? It by osmosis? You have to be able to share that, right? And do this with gentleness and respect. You're not there to win any arguments. You just know where your hope is from, right? I want you to listen just real briefly. This is Walt Heyer. He's an older gentleman who transitioned and then detransitioned. He went from a guy to a woman, and he was for many years. And then God got a hold and showed him. And so we're going to listen on the big screens uh, to just a couple of minutes from Walt Heyer as he talks about this. with hormones and say huh Mm. interesting let's take you back to four five six years old i believe Mm -hmm. after reading your story right you had a relationship with your grandmother you point to that as the beginning take it from there for me being uh, my grandmother was a seamstress she made dresses for ladies that's how she earned an income she was very poor and i got curious about you know her making dresses and and i made some indication to her that I wanted to dress and so she made me a purple chiffon evening dress just for my little four-year-old body and then what I didn't realize that I can share with you today that looking back at this what I realized is the second she put that purple dress on me and started affirming me what really came through was she was actually saying there was something wrong with Walt Mm. and so you can't affirm somebody in a in a different gender without at the very same time saying there's something wrong with you the way you really are. Yeah, the, the other part I wanted to dig out that I caught in your story was the warmth and acceptance you felt when you did this with your grandmother. Yeah. It was a safe place. Right. That's powerful to oh. me because yeah. as an orphan kid, I mean, people that I came into contact with that affirmed me or even noticed me made such a difference to me in my identity that I matter to somebody. So I identified with that. When you talked about the warmth and acceptance you felt when your grandmother would do this, man, that's powerful. I think it's even addictive. You know, you want that so much that you will repeat the behavior to get the affirmations back. So there's this thing where you actually continue to do this so you continue to get affirmed. Yeah. We all like to be affirmed. I always love technology, as hard as you try to get it right. I hope you heard the content of what he said, though. So when he was four years old, his grandmother made him a big purple dress and really affirmed him in how he looked in that purple dress. You know, we have to be careful what we say to others. We may be, be thinking really innocently, and he makes a really good point, and he counsels a lot of, of, of uh, uh, transgender individuals. If you affirm somebody in one sex, you're saying they are not right in the other. And so when his grandmother said, you're, you're wonderful in that dress, he was really saying, she was saying, you're not okay as a boy. And, and so you can't have it both ways. And uh, it's made me really think about how we make comments with people. And then the need for affirmation Right? That is huge. And so we have young people especially going to YouTube looking for affirmation because they're not finding it at home. That's why on this Father's Day it's so important for us to remember 
keep the communication lines open. And that's not always the easiest thing, especially when our kids get to be teenagers. So we need to listen. You got two ears and one mouth to listen twice as much as you speak. You've heard that before. Uh, be curious, not critical, and know the gospel. You've got to know the gospel. You got to know we're all broken and that the only solution is in Jesus Christ. And don't shrink back from that. You're not going to win popularity contests by being a Christian today. But you're going to bring some people to faith in Jesus Christ for eternity. And it's for eternity. Say eternity. All of you. Eternity. That's forever. That's what we're trying to make a difference for. So next week, we're going to talk in depth how Christians respond. If you have any questions, send them to me at pj at facesugarland.org because I would love to hear your questions and then be able to share how do we respond as Christians uh, in, in this world today, right? This is, a, a, this is a, an individual, a homosexual individual asked me, why would God make me in a way that he rejects me? Great question, isn't it? So we need to be able to respond and help people grow in Christ. Let's close with a prayer. Lord, I, I just thank you this morning for us to be able to speak on this and for the great attention that people have given to this. Lord Jesus, it's through you that we're born again. And through you we're made whole. And we pray for every person that's hearing today, Lord, that we would believe that with all our heart and that we would recognize that you use us to help others know that as well. To that end, we pray in Jesus' name and everyone said, amen.